All right. Thank you guys for joining today. We're going to go ahead and get started. So today um, I put this kind of presentation together and I, I reached out to Stacy, who is an awesome advocate. Um, but truly, I just want to give you just a two minute story of how, of how this came about. So I do uh, workplace trainings on neurodiversity in the workplace. And without fail, the first question that I always get is, what if my child may have dyslexia or ADHD or autism? What do I do and how do I get them help? And to be quite honest, I work a lot in the workplaces with career professionals and I have my own children. So I've gone through the process a few times, but I am not the expert in that. So I, I wanted to put together this webinar and we'll have it recorded so that people have a resource and they can refer back to it as needed because there's different points in all of our parent journeys where we need a resource like this. And to be honest, I couldn't find one when I was looking for one uh, many years back. So I'm so excited to have Stacy here with us today. Um, I, I've kind of given you my intro. I'm Nancy Disbro. I founded Neurosity, which is a, um, a solely focused on workplace training with neurodiversity. Um, and I'd love, Stacy, just kind of maybe you can give a quick background on, on what you do and how you came about in this. Sure. Uh, my name is Stacy Carriger. I own Carriger Educational Advocacy. I'm based out of Georgia, uh, but I have clients all over the United States that I help with because though the uh, educational laws have a tendency to be federal, it can get a little bit trickier depending on state by state. Um, let's see, I have 10 years experience doing educational advocacy, but I'm not just an advocate, I'm also a tutor for kids that are dyslexic. I have a master's in teaching early childhood. Um, let's see, a dyslexia advocacy certificate from the Dyslexia Training Institute. And I was trained by COPA, which is the Council of Parent Advocates and Attorneys for uh, Special Education Advocacy. That's a lot going on, I know, but let's just go with the fact that I, I've done my research, I have a lot of knowledge on the subject, and I will do my best to answer whatever questions people have. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So let's go into, I wanted just to share quickly, um, maybe some things that no one ever told us. So I think so many times we get the diagnosis, right? And and we we find out, okay, great. Like that that's awesome because now I know what to work with. But then we're kind of left to our own devices, right? Like it's like, now what am I supposed to do? And and most pediatricians are like, I don't know. Um, neuropsychologists may give you a report and give you some resources, but like it's all on paper and it's not, it's it's just generally kind of leaves you hanging. So um, we put together just a few kind of what we wish people would have told us during the process. And and Stacey, feel free to jump in here. Um, the the first thing is that there are specialized tutors and support for children with dyslexia. If you go to the big box tutoring places, they're generally not trained and they don't have the same resources and they're not going to be as effective. So as much as it's tempting to go to your local tutoring place that's in like a strip mall, that's probably not the best for your child. And I really encourage you to do your research. Um, Cece, can you maybe like just kind of cover a few different courses that parents like should maybe look out for the names? Yeah, absolutely. So basically when a kid is has dyslexia, you need to look for something that's structured, multi-sensory, explicit instruction. I know it's fancy talk, but basically using all your senses, making sure that they are directly teaching these subjects, like teaching the spelling directly. Don't just do it offhanded. Let's read a story and then let's talk about that there's some vowel teams in here. That's not the way that goes. And just making sure that it's structured. So a lot of times in a classic um, classroom setting, they have their structure may not look the same for a kid that is dyslexic, right? Everything kind of tears on top of one of the other. So you learn about short vowels first, and then you move on to blends and so forth and so on. It's supposed to take one, I guess you would say one concept and build on it, which a lot of times in a regular classroom setting, it may not go that way. So those are the key like buzzwords that I would look for, but Orton Gillingham teaching approach is really uh, definitely popular right now. There's also something called structured word inquiry, which um, goes a different route, but still same bu buzzwords. It depends on your child. But definitely um, multi-sensory structured literacy is another uh, 
term that you can use as well. But if and if in doubt, go to the International Dyslexia Association website. They have some great resources to get you started on what to look for when it comes to a tutor for your child. Awesome. But that's great. You know, one thing I struggled with too was that my daughter <clears throat> um, was quite a bit further than like knowing her letters when we got her diagnosed. And so part of me was like, well, is she going backwards to like learn these like vowel sounds and what seemed like kind of kindergarten work. And I would mm -hmm. imagine even if you're in junior high, you might have to go back to there to start. Um, is that the case? It can be, um, depending on the program you end up having or, or what have you. A lot of times the, the teachers that are using these approaches, they will go backwards because there's a, there is a break in the foundation of skills for reading and spelling. So what they do is they come in and they fill in the cracks. Now, the good thing about having like a one-on-one -on -one situation is your tutor will know your child. They'll do the assessments. They'll take the evaluation that you got from your, from your doctors and they'll say, okay, well, you know, you know, Maggie obviously has is doing great here, but she struggles here. Let's close that gap. So before we move on, right? So especially when it comes to like a middle school or a high school person, they will probably try to go faster and they'll and they'll understand their personality too. Uh, one thing you need to look out for when you're getting um, a tutor is to make sure they're doing their research to get to know your child, just not academically, but like social emotionally, right? You know, your kid works better with like, you know, a happy, optimistic, you know, relaxed tutor, look for that tutor because it is going, they're going to come in and fill up those cracks and that kid's not going to want to do the work, right? It's, it makes them feel like a baby, but the, t the tutor is going, a good tutor is going to connect with them and be able to fill in the gaps and do it quick enough to where they feel like they're making actual progress, actual growth. So, yeah, no, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so the second one is that I was hoping that teachers would understand when I said that my daughter got diagnosed with dyslexia, what that actually meant. And I was surprised and saddened <laughs> to understand how much or how little training they actually got during their educational process. And I just want to be clear, I am not at all discounting teachers. I think that they all go into teaching to help children. Like I, I yeah. truly don't think anybody signs up for that job and doesn't want to help children, but unfortunately yeah. the education system isn't set up to give them the knowledge to, to help as much as I was hoping. I will say it's getting better. Um, I'm in Ohio and we passed a law just this past year where all teachers for K through five, I believe have to get um, more dyslexia training and we're starting to screen earlier but there's still a lot of gaps to fill. So I don't know if oh, yes. you've had that experience as well. Oh yes, Georgia finally started passing some, some laws not too long ago, trying to get the screening done early and helping teachers be more trained. But again, it's a slow process. And there are certain counties that are putting in the money to get that stuff done, the larger ones around the big cities. But then you come out and then there are teachers that don't realize that dyslexia exists. I had a client last week tell me that the teacher said that there's no such thing as dyslexia. <laughs> so and she was in like the south part of Georgia so it, it comes and it goes and it's not on the teachers and I, I want you to understand like these teachers like you said are doing the best they can with the resources that they have if their administrators aren't there to help them to train them to make them feel like they could come to them for support if they have questions they're only going to do what they can what they have right so finding, being open to the, your teachers, talking to your teachers, giving your teachers the materials and resources, like going to the IDA website, right? And being like, hey, check this out. It actually does exist. Don't want to be weird, right? <laughs> like it's, it's totally normal. But yeah, I mean, just like, I think it was actually earlier this week, I sat down with a few teachers and they actually told me that they're not allowed to tell like kids that they think that they might be dyslexic, right? So there's this huge, there's this huge gap in understanding. Some teachers totally know it, they're on the ball and that's because those counties spend the money. Some teachers know it and they can't say anything because the admins make them feel like they're going to get retaliated and lose their job. And then there's some that really just don't know and that is not really their fault. So 
It's mostly just making sure that you have a clear communication with your kids' teachers, making sure that you're in the know so that you can help them be in the know, and just, you know, helping them out because we all know they're underpaid and overworked. So absolutely, any way to help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I love that. Um, the next one is something that, that I hear all the time in the workplace is that they had no idea. Most people have no idea that dyslexia is an amazing gift. Oh, yeah. And there are so many strengths tied to it. Unfortunately, the school system just isn't built and the school process isn't really built for that. But once these children, if we can get them through with their self-confidence intact, <clears throat> have amazing gifts to, to bring to the world. And we can, we can start to play on that much earlier during their school years too. We just have to know and kind of be on the lookout for what are these special kind of, I don't want to say superpowers. I know that's kind of controversial, but <laughs> it, it, it kind of it looks like it and my son is very different than my daughter they're both dyslexic but have way different superpowers and and amazing yeah. so well their brains are working harder than our like an average person's brain i mean you think about it it's like okay you want to go from a to b it's a straight shot on an interstate right for your child it's like back roads go around that way oh no we hit a stop sign we need to go a different way make a u-turn but i'm gonna get there right and it's exhausting and so i'm sure you've seen it when the kid gets home from school they just they're done mentally, emotionally. Sometimes you get meltdowns when you come home and you don't understand why. It's because the, their brain is working so much harder. But what it does is it it makes the brain work so much harder for so many other things. And they're more creative and they're more hands-on and they're better problem solvers. And also they have to, it actually helps them understand how to work in a group setting because they're having to figure out and problem solve with others, right? And they're, they know that they're not like everybody else, but they want to, they want to succeed. It's not laziness, right? So, being mindful of the fact that they have these these abilities to do so much more that you and I can do, but also being mindful of the fact that they're exhausted. <laughs> I mean, I'm exhausted just thinking about it, but they can do so much, but sometimes they just, it's just overwhelming. It's yeah. a gift, but it's an overwhelming gift. <laughs> it, is. it is, absolutely, absolutely. And the, the great part is once you get out of school, you can kind of tailor what you do in oh, yeah. life, right? But absolutely. in school, you're, you're, I mean, you don't have a whole lot of choices, so. No, nope. you still got to do the assignments. You still got to do the essays and the reports. And a lot of times your teachers would be like, nope, I, I need the essay. I don't care that you want to do an oral report, right? And which is one of those battles that as a parent, you're going to have to battle. You're going to have to say, look, my kid, she knows her stuff, but let me find a different way to show you that she knows her stuff. She's exhausted mentally, right? Let's try a different way. So as you get to know dyslexia as a whole, how your child deals with it, the more communication you have with your child and your teacher, the better. So absolutely. Yes. Um, the next one is, I wish somebody told me that it was hereditary. <laughs> I mean, I put the yeah. puzzle pieces together <laughs> myself, but gosh, that would have been nice to know that I didn't like have to have these like, aha moments all along. It is highly hereditary. And oh, yeah. as you start looking back in past generations, at least for me, it was like, it was so clear. Um, I talk about it like the the Clark Griswold, like Christmas vacation lights, like the whole <laughs> house like lit up at one time. I'm like, oh, my yeah. gosh. That makes um, sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and if, if, if your child has gotten diagnosed, I would highly encourage parents to like look back because I think that those can be wonderful conversations too of, yeah. Hey, look, your, your mom or your dad, you know, struggled in school like you and look at what they're doing. They're, they're successful and they're doing this. And yeah. so those are kind of like good ways to <clears throat> have that conversation and mm -hmm. It, it makes them feel not so alone too, I think. Exactly. And, you know, as like an adult, looking at your child's like uh, psychological report, seeing the recommendations, don't hurt. It doesn't hurt to look at them and go, can I do that too? <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, I should be doing note taking this way. What you find as an adult is like, oh, I do like voice to text when I write my emails. I do like that I have Grammarly on my computer because I don't catch 70% of it, right? And I have, I do struggle with there, 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 or commas, right? And you find all these little things and these aha moments should connect you with your kid and you should never feel ashamed to look at those recommendations that the psychologist has at the end and go, 
what can I do? Should I look at audiobooks? Right? <laughs> like yeah. there's yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. You should embrace it and then find that as like a, a connection with your kid. It's a yeah. great way. And 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 to your point, like modeling that when I'm using audiobooks, I think my my children feel less like it's their thing and more of it's just a thing, right? It doesn't yeah. it's not a special needs thing. It's just something that can help a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and we'll talk about later about certain accommodations that can get a little tricky, but audiobooks, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not dyslexic. It doesn't run in the family, but I love audiobooks. I, it helps me to be able to read my favorite book quicker and also be able to cook a dinner and do all these things. So there's no shame in using any of this. I mean, productivity for me, I'm like, let's go. <laughs> like any way that I can do the things that I want to do and, and still be able to read my books. But yeah, I mean, and there is some, I don't know why the, the, well, I guess there's some sort of like shame about the fact that they didn't know that they're dyslexic and there shouldn't be, you know, like, just like how it is now, teachers are just now learning and so you can imagine, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had no idea. The teachers definitely didn't have an idea, right? <laughs> so giving yourself grace and making sure that you give your child grace is like the first step and then go at it together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, good. And then the last one is, I, I wish, I wish a lot of people would have told me this, that, that getting my child the right resources and support would mm -hmm. probably not be easy. Because I just assumed that once I had a medical diagnosis and a piece of paper, that that would be it. But unfortunately, at least for our family with my daughter, it took me three different testing and reports to put her through to get all the documentation yeah. for the school to <laughs> listen. Um, yeah. Luckily with my son, I didn't have to go as many times, but I just, I, I had no idea how hard I would have to fight and the emotional battle that comes with that as a parent when mm -hmm. you're trusting in the school system to do everything that they can do and it's it can be disheartening so i i don't like to focus too much on the negatives but i think it's a very real situation that somebody's got to say it out loud <laughs> yep actually it there like i said before there are admins that tell teachers not to say anything to parents they think they're going to get sued admins have told teachers that they could get sued if you tell a kid or tell a parent that their kid needs to get tested. They're also worried that the te that the parents are going to get mad at the teacher and say, how dare you? My child's perfectly normal, right? Which is terrible. It's a terrible like feeling of this guilt mixed with like worry. And so just because your teacher doesn't say anything, you still need to find a way to say something. Trust your gut. You know your kid. If they're struggling, say something, right? You, whether If it wasn't academics, it was something else. You see your kid at football and they're struggling at football. It wouldn't, you know you wouldn't stop yourself from talking to the coach, right? Or if your kid's struggling on the school bus, you'd certainly go up to the school bus driver and be like, what's going on? The same, game, same thing goes for education. If your child's struggling or they come home exhausted or they hate school, ask yourself why and go up there and say something. And the I, it's pretty common actually for parents to believe that a school will do whatever is best and they'll say something if they, if they see something. But unfortunately, our school systems are run by money, by funds. If your child has dyslexia and they qualify for special education, that means that they could get an IEP. And an IEP means goals and goals means services. That means they have to pay somebody to take, you know, your kid out and do, you know, reading or spelling or math. And that's all they see are dollar signs, unfortunately. That's the admins, not the teachers. So if anybody get mad at the, maybe get mad at the admins. <laughs> <laughs> so, I sorry. agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No, absolutely. All right. Good. Well, thank you uh, for mm -hmm. kind of going through those. I think, I think that alone could be helpful for parents as they're starting this journey. <clears throat> and I, I heard not too long ago, I think it was in this week for sure, that you feel like when you're getting that diagnosis that you're like, you've kind of like completed the journey, but yet mm -hmm. you're, you'll soon find out you're just starting the journey at that point. Oh, yeah. right? Like th this is, this is an evolving process for you and your child and your entire family honestly mm -hmm. um, absolutely yeah. okay so we'll jump into some of the questions i get most often um and the the first one that that i i hear maybe not the most frequently asked but it, it's frequent um 
the where's the best place to get my son or daughter tested? Like, so they don't have a diagnosis yet, but where would you recommend them starting if they're concerned? Well, so first things first, child psychologist is the only one that can diagnose. There are neuropsychologists and things like that. They have a tendency to diagnose more about just the brain function. If you want a child psychologist with a diagnosis of dyslexia, that's that's the way to go. And number two, look on Facebook. I know that sounds really weird, but if you're part of any groups, like parent groups, um, you go in there and you say, hey, I think my child has dyslexia. Where did you get your child's you know, diagnosis? And I would go towards one of them. Um, a lot of times you also learn from parents what insurances are covered there too. Did they help out, right? Um, if you have um, like a diagnosis of dys or dyslexia, that's great. That's how you get the whole process started for an IEP or a 504. But a lot of times too, you may not be able to get the diagnosis because it's expensive or your insurance doesn't cover it. There is another route. You go straight to the school and you ask them, you know, I believe my child has dyslexia. Here are the issues, please test her and they go off and they test her now of course there's always a way they could say no it's very rare mind you but that gets it started when you maybe don't have the money to cover the private testing now keep in mind private testing gives you a diagnosis of dyslexia schools do not they go okay they, this child is, qualifies under the category of dyslexia or she looks like she might have dyslexia they don't give you diagnosis, but if you want a diagnosis, you got to do it privately through a child psychologist. And like I said, Facebook groups of families that are have children that are dyslexic or anything like that is the best place to start. <clears throat> and if you don't want to go that route, go to Google, look at the child psychologist, and look at their background and see what their background is. If it's specializing in dyslexia, dyscalculia, or dysgraphia, all the disses, <laughs> I would I would definitely at least call them and talk to them and and tell them your your situation and you know you'll get a better understanding of you know what what you're coming up to I guess. Yes, I, I absolutely agree, <clears throat> and I think it's good just to to briefly mention that these tests are not an hour or two long, right? Like these are like yeah. intensive. So if anybody tries to say that like, oh yeah, we can test for dyslexia online or for just an hour or two, for me, that would be a red flag for you too, Stacey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tests for dyslexia should include like IQ tests. It should, you'll have the Woodcock Johnson, the Wyatt, right? There should be a Basque or a Connors. Those are tests that are for attention deficits because a lot of times kids are dyslexic will also have attention deficit issues, right? The comorbidity is what you might call it in fancy talk. But the fact is, is they should be doing extensive measures and it should take, <clears throat> I mean, I've seen people do it in one day but then your child's there for six, seven hours. A lot of times they'll do it over two or three sessions, a few hours at a time. So, but yeah, definitely if it's just a screener, going to like someone, you know, just to see if your child might be dyslexic, I don't think it's really worth it. Mm -hmm. I think personally getting a full diagnosis or going straight to the school, if you can't afford it, um, to get testing. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, okay, so now we've we've got tested, we've got the diagnosis, um, let's say from a doctor. Um, how do you request that your child get support in school? Like what, like, do you send an email? Do you call? Oh, them? yeah. Like, what do you do? <laughs> Don't do calling. Okay, when in doubt, write it out. That's just it as an advocate. Um, you should always have evidence. So emailing would be a really good one, but I've gone so far as to email and send certified mail because I know the admins there and I know how tricky they can be. <laughs> but you know if, if you don't have any evidence of them being tricky you could email but i would email your principal the general education teacher for your child and the special education coordinator and you can find all of that information on your school's website you just click a ball on there and you say to whom it may concern my my child johnny is in fifth grade in miss miller's class at blah 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 elementary school um i have concerns that he might be dyslexic because of these things right have actual facts that show what your concerns are like his grades are up and down he reads at this rate he's blah 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 here right and and it, then you say something i know it sounds kind of silly but kind of pulling at the heartstrings 
saying something like, I'm concerned that this will affect little Johnny into middle school and then eventually here and then he will stop loving reading and spelling and it will all these things right. And then you'd put at the end, you know, please consider this my approval for him to be tested and then put I, I hope to be hearing within the next 10 consecutive days right because there are laws they're supposed to write back within a certain calendar period. I believe it's 10 days, uh, at least here in Georgia, but we uh, I would check your laws to see and they should always respond back via email saying, yes, let's get them tested. We'll send forms and paperwork or whatever. Just keep in mind, a private diagnosis is great, but they still have to do their own testing. So <clears throat> I'm sure, Nancy, you're, you're familiar. You had your own testing, which is all well and good, right? But they still did their own stuff and that included observations too. So that's actually really helpful because <laughs> wow. they have to have a full diagnosis. No school should ever just take a private eval and say, thanks, we're going to give him services. Mm -mm -mm -mm. They need to be doing their own stuff too, which does take a few weeks. But in the end, it's worth it when you think about all the things you can give your child. So yeah, absolutely. So then just kind of walking through this process, because I think it would have been, oh, it's okay. I, I think it would have been helpful to know kind of like what I was in for. So when, so you, you write, they, they do the evaluations and then what happens after that generally, like between you and the school? So you have a few steps. Uh, the next step is to talk about the results. The child psychologist who did the testing has to be there at that meeting. So you go in and she goes through all the results. You could actually, I suggest personally getting the results sent to you prior to. Like even if it's 24, 48 hours, as long as you have it before, because you can go in, you can highlight, you can put your little questions in pencil, right? So because it they have a tendency to go really fast. And to be fair is a lot of numbers, <laughs> right? So you're just like, sure, uh-huh, mm -hmm, right? <laughs> and you don't have a chance to really like have it all in and like absorb the information about your child. Like 21st percentile, what does that mean? How does that compare to the other kid that sits next to little Johnny, right? So getting this the evaluation a couple days before and there's no harm in asking for it. Worst thing they could say is no, right? Sitting down, talking about the results. And then the next part, whether it's that same day or another meeting, it depends how long the results take. <clears throat> is the eligibility meeting and what that mean is is as a team you talk about how your child if they qualify there's certain things that they have to check off to say that they qualify and you make this decision as a, as a team so no matter if you go the 504 route or an iep route they talk about your eligibility right and at that point once you're eligible or not found eligible it could go either way you could have the meeting to actually create an IEP or a 504 or nothing. <coughs> Sorry. So at that, that's okay. Um, <laughs> at that meeting, if they if they say your child isn't eligible, um, but you know, I mean, you've got the neuropsych reports and you feel like your child should be eligible. Is there something that they can, like a parent can do at that point if they disagree? Because it's a team. So does the whole team have to agree? Um, yes. So even if you don't agree, they could obviously, they could still say no, and then you don't get anything. But that doesn't mean you stop there. You say, okay, great. Thank you for your comment. But I'd like to get a prior written notice stating why, right? And they do, they send that out. It's an official letter saying, hey, you know, little Johnny doesn't qualify for these reasons. And you could fight it. You could go through mediation. You can go through due process, which are the more legal routes. But <clears throat> it's totally up to you. A lot of times, some people will go for an IEP and then find that they don't qualify because there's a lot more stuff going on with an IEP. And then they go for a 504, right, which is a lot less, but it still gives you accommodations modifications, which we'll talk about more, I think, later. But so you have options. Basically, it's this weird route that <laughs> and there's, there's a long process but in the end there is i really truly believe there's always a choice you could there's still a 504 available out there for kids that really do need something right mm -hmm. and trust your gut you know if you if you know that your kid is dyslexic you feel it you feel like you were you should have been diagnosed with it right don't stop don't stop asking questions and continue to fight it 
I think that that, if I can say anything like 500 times, it would be that. Like, do not, if you feel like your child is not getting what they need, like, don't, do not stop because Mm -hmm. nobody else is going to fight for your child like you. Like, it's It's true. And it's an emotional journey. And I think, like, when you said to have the report 24 to 48 hours, at least, you know, prior, it's an emotional time for most parents to read through that. And I mean, you already know your child's struggling, right? Like you see them coming home every afternoon and you get it and you see it in real life, but to read it on paper is, is next level. I think for a lot of people, especially for me, especially I was like, oh my gosh, like there's numbers to confirm what I'm feeling. And, and you read some stuff that you may not have seen, like your child Mm -hmm. may have anxiety in school that you don't, you, of course, you no way you would see that. Right. Yeah. Um, And so, yeah, like it, it's, it's an emotional process. And I do think, um, I'm so happy to have you here because I, I did have an advocate, um, through part of my process, which, which I needed to get the services for my daughter, but that was um, an amazing benefit to me as well, that I could have somebody there that wasn't emotionally attached to my child and, was just literally knew all the laws, knew everything and could fight tooth and nail for my child. And I could just be the mom, just at least like 25%. I could just be the mom in that situation. Um, And, and that, like, I I just, I don't think enough people talk about the emotional stress of going through that too. And you would just hope that everybody would want the best for every child. Um, Mm -hmm. But, but there's a lot going on that we don't see too. So yeah, it's a path. It's a serious path full of lots of questions and concerns. And most of the time, the reason why parents give, give up is because they don't know to ask the question. There is no question that is stupid, right? None. I mean, worst case scenario, they answer it quickly. Darn, right? But at least you know your answer. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. I'd rather ask the question than not. And like, if they say no to something, they have to give you prior written notice, which is that letter in the mail, right? Or email, it's stating why. And the worst case scenario is you just, you could stop there or keep going, but I would always keep asking, never stop asking questions. Absolutely, I agree. Um, It's probably a good time um, in our talk too, just to talk about the IEP versus a 504, Mm -hmm. just kind of high level of, of what the difference is and what the child would get differently. So IEPs and 504s are governed by two separate laws, not to get too into it, but so the IEP is way more extensive. It comes with goals. It comes with not just accommodations and modifications, which is what a 504 comes with, but it also comes with services and it's extensive. Like if you've ever seen an IEP before, it's like 20 to 30 pages long. Some can even be 40 if you've been in the system that long with that many, that much testing, right? So (laughs) it's, it depends on your child, which one to do. A 504 is governed by like American Disabilities Act. So it's mostly for if you have a disability or a diagnosis of a disability and it affects your ability to access curriculum. So it's not as extensive. It does not require parent participation. So you don't have a lot of say in it, but it is helpful if like, you just need a few things here and there. For instance, I've had clients that are doing really great at school, but have dyslexia and have test anxiety, like up the yin yang, right? So this parent was like, look, I don't really need all this. Like, and I'm doing private testing or private tutoring and I'm fine paying for it. Like we're doing great. We don't need to get there. But I just want like when my kid does the the state testing that she doesn't completely bomb it and have to stay in this in this grade level all because of this, right? So she did a 504. But then I have other ones that are like dyslexic and three grades behind and mom and dad can't pay for tutor out, you know, tutoring outside of school, go for an IEP. But I would not really ever start at a 504, really. For me personally, I get the testing done for my child. And then I'd say, I request an IEP and they would go through the eligibility and they'd say no. And I'd say, well, we tried, <laughs> right? So, because the IEP covers so much more. These goals 
for an IEP, like let's say your child is reading at a third grade level, level, but they're in middle school. Each goal is specific to your child's weakness. So like if not just the testing that you did, but like the grades that your child gets, right? And the fact that your child is ADD or presents, you know, maybe ADD, right? Every goal is specific to a weakness for your child. And that teacher is has to, by law, work towards that goal and be able to give you progress reports when you get your report cards about how they're doing. And if your child's doing really well, then you go back to the drawing board and create new goals. And this is a continuous process. Technically, it's yearly, but you could come back multiple times throughout the year. It depends on your child. IEPs are just that. They're individualized plans, right? 504s are a little more generic. I mean, 504s could be one paper. Child needs preferential seating, extra time on test. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Uh, a different place to test, you know, or being able to have the proctor read the questions and the answers in a multiple choice, right? Because they're so dyslexic, so far behind, but they know the content, right? So they're both, it depends on your child and your child's needs, but just know IEP is extensive, 504 is not. And then lastly, IEPs go all throughout high school. Technically, you could have an IEP until you're 21, but that does not mean that a college will honor it. <laughs> That means you could be 21 and being a freshman in college. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what that means is, like, let's say little Johnny had an IEP throughout his whole entire school journey and decides to go to, I don't know, University of Georgia. And he goes there and says, here's my IEP. The University of Georgia can say, that's nice. We don't honor it here. <laughs> It's not a, it stops when you go to college. They may honor parts of it, but not all of it. And what they end up doing is taking it and making it a 504 plan. There's no goals, there's no services. It's just a little extra help here and there. A 504 plan can go forever <laughs> and go throughout college. But again, no matter what, no matter what, if you go in college, they do not have to honor it. So one thing when you're going through this whole process of IEPs and 504s, the plan is, is that you start with a whole bunch of good, you know, goals and uh, accommodations and modifications. But as a child gets older, you go a little less and a little less because the goal of this is for your child to become independent, for your child to get better, right? If your child's in 11th grade and been having an IEP since they were in second and their goals are not to where their life skills and they can get out of high school that's a problem and that's that's a problem that you need to talk to your your team but the point is is that it should grow with your child and it should minimize so that when they get out of high school they're focusing on what they want to do next with their life and not hey my child is only reading at a third grade level that should have been fixed prior to which is why it's important to get this process started early so that it can evolve with your child yeah Absolutely. Sorry, did I go completely no, crazy? No, no. That's, that's awesome. that's awesome. And I, and I agree. Like it's it's one of those things where, um, and and I think it's important to mention too that accommodations are built into the IEP too, right? Mm -hmm. So just because you have an IEP doesn't mean you don't have accommodations. It just has right. It just has more. It's got more meat yeah. to it. Um, and it's definitely more. I, I would say, like you said, more legally binding for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, the goal is to get our children to be independent. They are super smart kids, mm -hmm. right? Like they don't. They're not going to need all this forever, especially even with ADHD. I know this talks on dyslexia, but with ADHD, their their executive functioning just takes longer to develop. So right. when the, a child's 30% behind, you know, an eight-year-old, you're treating more like a five-year-old in some areas, but that eventually catches up and then they don't right. need all of that. So yeah, I think I think it's great and, and super, super, super helpful. Um, well, and when you have a kid that has like attention de deficit issues, like, you start with goals like, you know, let's say right now they have someone writing in their organizer, their agenda, all their homework, and it gets sent home to mom in an email too. But then slowly but surely, he has to write it down three days a week mm -hmm. and it has to be legible. And then when they get to high school, the idea that they can use their iPad or their phone to take a picture of the whiteboard where the homework is, right? And then eventually they use that in college, right? So you start with all this stuff and you, your goals should move with your child's independence. So if you're, 
that way you're not like in senior in high school and someone is still writing down your homework. This should be fixed earlier so he could slow he or she could slowly be more independent later. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> um and I know you touched on some of the accommodations. I would say to, you know, audiobooks are obviously something that that is great. Um and yeah. there's some really great resources um for that. I've got some on my website and and maybe you do as well. Um mm-hmm. but yeah, there's there's some free options or some that you have to have a diagnosis, but then it's, you know, kind of free or at least very low cost. Um but mm-hmm. the public libraries usually have like a really good supply of of audio. Well, yeah. Yeah, they actually have textbooks too. Granted, the the way that sometimes they speak may not may be a little bit more robotic, but it's free if you, you know, like live in a certain county. So why not try it out first? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, I agree. And for my for my older child, um, it was it's pretty important that she doesn't only have audio. So she carries a book, she reads it, but then she's listening to it at the same time. So she yeah. doesn't feel different but she's got both options, which, which yeah. seems to, to work pretty well. Um, sure. Any other accommodations that, that you see that work? Well, so extra time on tests and assignments are helpful. Do not take off for spelling. Mm. I mean, unless it's a spelling test, which they shouldn't be doing anyway. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> but, but text-to-speech software, when like there's longer assignments, especially when your kid's in middle school or high school, right? Just a lot of times just working on getting the sentences out to where they make sense is hard enough for them, but getting bogged down of the writing can be quite difficult as well. So, and the ability to demonstrate mastery using different ways, right? Like I said earlier, you know, my child might struggle with writing an essay on, you know, the life of Abraham Lincoln, but can she make a tri board? Can she do a podcast? Can we, like there's what if she did some sort of artwork or you know anything right the, thinking outside the box that's one of the beautiful things about our children is that they have these abilities to think outside the box right so why not embrace it by giving you know a demonstrating mastery a different way because they, they just do right mm-hmm. um let's see graphic organizers are really helpful fill in the blank notes are really helpful um Preferential seating, seating for sure is helpful too, um, but yeah, uh, other things. Let's see, I'm grading um, like those those transparent readers too, <clears throat> where kind of like, oh, yeah. like a ruler, but like it's got a certain color mm-hmm. in the middle. Those help oh, yes. those uh, quite a bit too, and they're really cheap on Amazon. I've got them on my website. They are. There's links. They but- are. There, yeah. you can have like 50 of them around the house for ten dollars <laughs> you really can and you'll find i mean and it depends on your kiddo like a lot of times you'll find that you may give them like 10 15 like accommodations and then little johnny like the next time you have a meeting or whatever i usually suggest three to four months after you've created your very first iep for your for your child have another meeting with your teachers and say how's it going obviously i see the goals are going well or whatever but how about the accommodations is he using them Mm -hmm. are they helpful are they helpful for you too, right? Like I've had students before where they have the comorbidity of, of attention deficit issues and they use fidgets, but then we found that certain fidgets he hated and he liked other ones because they drew att- they drew less attention to him, right? So being always constantly talking with your teachers throughout the accommodations that you have, because it's gonna be, especially when you just start this process, you're gonna find what's the best that works for your child. Then it also depends on age, right? Like you're not, I mean, audiobooks are great no matter what age but like maybe um what is it like text to speech might be a little difficult depending on what your where your class uh, what kind of classroom you're in like second and third grade may not be may not work as well because they're not doing that right now right (laughs) or it's a smaller classroom it's more hands-on less on like a chromebook so you know you'll find as you go but the best thing to do is ask 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 like sit down with like a list of accommodations and say little johnny would do great with these mm-hmm. highlight them find the ones you really want to fight for and then really hold those and have good reasons for them and start there because we want to have a big one and then slowly but surely as little johnny gets older less and less and less right mm-hmm. so That's awesome. <clears throat> um the other things i was thinking um to be clear on if the child has to advocate for themselves or if oh, yeah. it's the teacher's responsibility to like offer because I know mm-hmm. in those younger grades and just depending on the child like they may not want to ask to go to a separate room to do the test yep. or whatever it is and 
although they know they need it, they just don't want it. So I think like having that clearly defined in there, also oh, yeah. having clearly defined what are not punishments. So yeah. like taking away recess is not oh, okay, no. no matter what. Um, those are the children that need it the most. And if I could wave a flag about that every day, I would. But um, like those type of punishments do not help at all. And they only build, like break down that self-confidence more. I had a person that got extra time on assignments, class assignments, and their teacher was taking them out of their specials activity to finish. And I was like, she was like, but I'm following the IEP. I'm like, yeah, but you're penalizing my, my client. Like, you can't do that. Like, <laughs> we got to find a different way. Again, it's all about communicating with your teacher. This is this IEP process is new for them, too, right? They knew little Johnny was struggling. They didn't know how to help. And just like with you, trying to figure out what works, staying in constant communication to the point of maybe ir being irritating, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, better exactly. than not talking and then them, you know, not doing the IEP and it's been six months into the school year, right? So Absolutely. the other thing I would, I would say is seating options. Like, so there's preferential, but then there's also different types of seats that they could have. Mm -hmm. Or honestly, one of my kiddos doesn't like to be different, but he doesn't mind if he's in the back row of a classroom standing because he just thinks better when he stands. Honestly, he eats better when he stands. We just have kind of like a hula hoop of space that he has to stand at the dinner table, but I don't make him sit in a chair. He sat in a chair for how many hours a day? Um, exactly. So getting creative and then just thinking and like paying attention, I think to like when your kid does best too. Like I know yeah. my child does really well standing up and tapping his foot and moving around a little. Like how do we make that work in a school setting? Um, yeah, like I would suggest to any parent like that's new this process, sit down, make a list of when your child does best. What are they physically doing? What is the best? I mean, like when little Johnny's doing homework, is he sitting at the table or is he standing at the table? Does he have a weird little ball in his hand or not? Does he do best with music on, right? So, and then taking that and you could go online and look up a list of accommodations for dyslexia and you could print them out and say, that would be good because he does this, right? And he does this and he does this, right? And then fix finding like the five main ones that you are, you know, will fight tooth and nail to have on their IEP or their 504, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, I think we have time for a few more. Um, what if the school district says that my child's not doing poorly enough that he or she doesn't need services? Well, that happens quite a bit. In fact, they love to do that um, from like kindergarten to third grade, <laughs> which is an absolute issue because that is like third grade, as we all know, is like the Mount Everest of grades. <laughs> this is where they get chapter books and they get independent reading and they're not just independently reading. Now they have independent reading and math work, right? And they're having to study for tests, like honest to goodness tests, no, no more fill in the blank or in multiple choice. So I gotta say, ignore it, trust your gut, do the testing, send that letter to the to your people at school and saying I that this is, you know, I'm concerned. So like I've had a client that she she her child is dyslexic. She knows that her child's dyslexic, but is getting A's and B's in school. And I was like, get the testing done. Just do it. Worst case scenario, they say no. And but sitting down and like saying, why are you doing this? What why are you testing? What is your outcome as a parent? What do you want for your child, right? And don't let go of that. Keep going. I mean, there's very rare that a school will say no to testing your child. Um, and there are laws and verbiage that actually support the fact that it doesn't matter if your child has good grades. It matters if all the other stuff, like I have student, that student I just said is getting A's and B's. Well, she's getting A's and B's because mom is paying for five days a week, Orton Gillingham approach tutoring, and mom is spending over an hour helping with homework. And mom is going through and emailing the teacher back and forth about the agenda because she can't read her child's writing. So when you write this letter to your admin saying that you want your child to get tested, say it i'm spending two hours and this much money a week just to make my child get you know be average like if i stopped all this she'd be epically failing you know and just 
go with that. I mean, there's all this extra work that you as the parent, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally that you're doing. And don't hesitate to tell these people when you're asking for testing, because they need to do the work. They need to do the testing and they need to tell you why, why not, right? And go from there. And if when in doubt, get an advocate. I mean, even if you don't hire them, most advocates do like a 30 minute complimentary call and they'll at least point you in the right direction, you know? Yeah. So and you've been yeah. very helpful on that. And um, yeah. I think you, I mean, you're just, you're such a good resource because you, you understand that you've been through it. And honestly, we're, we're not going through it on a daily basis like you, right? So um, certainly if there's anybody that would, we'll have Stacy's information at the end here up on the screen, um, but feel free to e email either one of us and we'll get you to the right place and get you the right resources because, Definitely. Um, I mean, as much as we make this our life passion, we we want to help no matter how, how sure. that works for both of Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's important too, just getting the documentation of asking for the testing, even if it doesn't actually happen at that point. Um, it took my daughter multiple years to get the right accommodations, but I could go back and say, no, we started this in second grade. And then I had a median third and then we had fourth. And so like that all helps kind of build that case too at the end. Yeah. And if um, I may say like, there's just a few things like no matter what, if, you, if there's nothing that you take away from this, you know, webinar, it's the fact that documentation is necessary. No let me go talk to the teacher in person. Let me give her a call. No, absolutely not. Everything should be documented, emailed. And if you do end up talking to them in person, come back with an email and say, it was so great talking to you today about blah, blah, blah. I'm so glad that you said this to me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need to have documentation and evidence because you need to have a paper trail because if they ever come back and say, mm, we don't think he needs it, but that's funny because I've talked to Miss Miller 10 times within the past two months about how he's struggling to pay attention. He's, he can't, he's struggling to read along, right? Evidence for sure. <clears throat> and no question is stupid. There's no, just ask the worst case scenario is they answer it quickly, right? And then you feel better that you asked, right? And that, I mean, those are the top two things I would say, if you take anything away from this. Oh, that, that's wonderful. Um, I think, I think we're running out of time here. I just want to make sure that I, I at least cover all the, the main questions. And we do have one person, um, I think that jumped in. So if there's a, any questions in the chat, we can certainly uh, address those as well. Um, I guess finally, if, while we're just kind of wrapping up, any, any last uh, kind of maybe maybe what does looking like when you hire an advocate kind of what does that look like like how do you help parents through that process i think that'd be kind of a good way to wrap up well first things first look for an advocate within your area first it's always better to find someone that's been working there for a while that knows the state laws and the federal of course you can still look outside of your area it's just it, a lot of times just like if you were going to hire a lawyer someone that's been there long enough that knows the people that knows the tricksters that knows the hearts of gold that are in your county that's the best thing to do first and if you're not sure you can go to copa.org c-o-p-a-a.org org and you can look they have a list of providers there i'm i'm one of them <laughs> and from there usually to have a complimentary call talk to them about your child from you know month zero to now right and they'll point you in the right direction they may take your case they may not but i i think it's always best to at least go out there and look I mean, talk to them about your kid and then make a decision from there. I mean, sometimes you need an advocate. Sometimes you need them later. Sometimes you might have been in this so long that you might need a lawyer, right? So just make sure that you're asking for help when you need it. And, and you know, definitely try to find somebody that knows both your state laws and your federal. So, yes, absolutely. Good. Um, well, perfect. I, I am not getting my slides to work here at the very last second. Oh, no. I don't know. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I got it. Uh, here's kind of our information um, that, you know, if, if, if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Check out our website if you need. There's resources, that type of thing. But but obviously, you know, anything we can do to help, we're here to help. This sure. is We've been through the process and it, it can be scary, but, but it doesn't have to be alone, I guess, is the main thing. So, yeah. And um, if you ever want to contact me, you can, like I said, I mostly work in Georgia, but I do work in other, in other states, including Florida, Texas, California, Washington, 
and a few others. <laughs> so if you if you're not sure where to start, you can contact me directly and I'll get you either set up with me or someone that is in your area, depending on where you are in this process. You might need a little more than just an advocate or you might not need anything. Who knows? Here's here's open, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Stacey, for joining today. And I, I truly appreciate it. This will be, we'll post it up on YouTube so that people can use it as a resource going forward. Um, but I truly appreciate your time and everything that you're doing to, to help yeah. our outer kids in the school system get the right support that they deserve. So 